Today is the 14th of March, and we have just returned uh, from our spring break, and we are going to begin Chapter 5 in the Thermodynamics textbook, and the title of Chapter 5 is Mass and Energy uh, Analysis. of control volumes. So to, re, to orient you to where we are with this discussion, uh, in the past, in chapter four, we talked about uh, energy analysis of closed systems. So if we have a closed system, that basically means that the mass at time one is equal to the mass at time two, or the mass that goes in is equal to the mass that goes out, which is equal to zero. In other words, there's no mass passing in or out of a closed system, and that is, in fact, the definition of a closed system. So what that means for us is that the only way that we can have energy transfer the uh, boundary of a closed system is through heat or work. In other words, energy forms that are not associated with mass. Well, in a control volume, this is no longer true. Um, we can have some mass that goes in, and we can have some mass that goes out. Uh, so those may or may not be equal to zero, not necessarily equal to zero, let's put it that way. Because you can just have mass going in or mass going out. So you could have zero, one of them be equal to zero. Um, and also that means that energy uh, crosses the boundary um, as heat, work, and with mass. So some examples of a, an open system, which is another name for control volume. Another name for control volume is an open system. Uh, one relatively simple example is a pipe through which fluid flows. If the pipe is flowing full, Uh, you'll have some mass that goes in and some mass that goes out, but in all likelihood, mass is not accumulating if this is an incompressible fluid. The mass at time one is equal to the mass at time two, um, and that means then that the mass going in has to equal the mass going out over some period of time. Uh, now, the energy associated with the mass going in and the mass going out may be different. For example, if the pipe is full of cold water and you turn the hot water faucet on and you have hot water then beginning to move through the pipe, you can see that the energy within the pipe itself is going to change because you're putting hot water in the pipe. So that at one period of time at mass, at time one, the energy is going to be the energy associated with cold water and at time two, it's going to be the energy associated with hot water. So we have those kind of uh, ideas. Now for a rigid pipe like this, we don't have any work. Work is still dependent on a change in volume, okay? Uh, but you could have heat going in or out. If the pipe is not insulated, as you're putting hot water in, the hot water can actually be cooling off to the environment, right? And so you can also have heat going in or out. Now, in terms of fluids and in terms of thermodynamics, pipes that flow full behave much differently than pipes that flow not full. Unfull pipes, um, partially filled pipes, behave more like open channels, like a ditch full of water. The math looks more like that than it does like a flowing full pipe. The main consideration is, is that when it's flowing full, you can change pressure. The, the pressure in the pipe can change based on 
just sort of the conditions of the pipe. If it's flowing empty, uh, the pressure is not really going to change. Just the um, kinetic energy, the potential energy, and the energy associated with the fluid. But so the equations for a flow full, uh, flowing full pipe uh, are a little bit different. They'll also call that sometimes a pressure pipe. Not because it's necessarily under a great deal of pressure, but because the pressure in the pipe can change if it's flowing full. All right, there are some other examples of control volumes. We're just kind of looking at a couple of them today. Uh, one that is really not all that interesting, but we'll do it, something that diffuses flow. So where you have a smaller inlet and a larger exit, possibly a compressible fluid. Um, this is referred to as a diffuser. And the opposite of a diffuser is where you flow from larger conditions to smaller conditions, which is called a nozzle. Okay. In both cases, uh, mass does not accumulate inside of a nozzle or a diffuser. In other words, the mass at time one is equal to the mass at time two in both cases. So that means that the mass going in has to equal the mass going out. Um, but once again, you can change based on all of these different parameters. The purpose of a diffuser, if you look at a larger area, is to slow a, few, uh, a fluid down to decrease the velocity or decrease the speed uh, at which the fluid flows, and a nozzle is the opposite. A nozzle is to increase uh, the velocity. And pipe fittings often resemble nozzles in the sense that if you have, for example, water, coming into a house uh, for, or even in, in commercial applications, but in residential applications, um, what happens is you'll have a larger pipe and then uh, you will lose some of the energy to friction as the fluid moves through that. And as you get closer and closer to the faucet, you'll decrease the size of the orifice and that just keeps the pressure um, higher so that you deliver, that's why they refer to, you know, when you talk about like water pressure in a house, they refer to it as water pressure, but pressure and velocity are directly proportional, in, or not directly proportional, but they're uh, a function of one another. So you can say you're keeping the volume up, or you can say that you're keeping the pressure up, but it's always referred to just sort of routinely as water pressure. But what you're really getting at is just not slacking off on the volume due to the pressure lot, due to the friction losses in the pipe. So. Um, another case, a simple case, where you might have a change in, uh, in mass is in a bathtub. I always like bathtub examples because they're quite simple and yet they demonstrate a principle. You start with some amount of mass at time one and then you add mass in. And if you leave the drain plug in place, the mass at time one plus the mass that comes in is equal to the mass at time two. The other thing that's interesting about a tub is that you could start out with no mass or you could start off with a little bit of mass and say that you put a little bit of water in the tub and the water was too cold, you might turn the faucet on with hot water. So you're not only changing the amount of mass, you're also changing the energy in the tub. So you can also say um, that the energy in the tub at time one plus the energy that comes in is equal to the energy at time two, right? Um, and then, of course, you can make it a little bit more complicated. Say that you do this, you have cold water in the tub, you put in hot water, and now the water is too hot, so you open up the drain and you drain some water out. You can then say that uh, the energy that comes, the energy at time one plus the energy that comes in minus the energy that comes, goes out is equal to the energy at time two and the mass at time one plus the mass that goes in minus the mass that goes out is equal to the mass at time two. And this is the way that we build up these equations. The, they all build directly on the stuff that we did in chapter four, which was the first law of thermodynamics for a closed system. But uh, when you have an open system, for a control volume. The solution 
almost always requires energy balance, which is referred to as the first law of thermodynamics. Energy is neither created nor destroyed unless you have a nuclear reaction, which we won't. And a mass balance, which is the conservation of mass. When we did uh, chapter four problems where we had closed system, the mass balance, we were still doing it, but it was easy. The mass at time two equals the mass at time one, period. Uh, but when you have mass flowing in and out, you have to do both. All right. So the other thing is, is that we can often, uh, if we have steady flow, which, let me write this down. I can't write and talk at the same time. If we have steady flow, or if we have a period of unsteady flow over which we can look at it in a steady manner. And when I talk about steady, what I really mean is smooth or a function that can be integrated or differentiated, okay? So in other words, if you have a bathtub and you have water sitting in the bathtub and then you turn the faucet on, but the faucet comes in either at a constant rate or at a constantly variable rate, you can integrate it over the period of time that the water is coming. You can differentiate it. Let's just talk about differentiating. You can differentiate it over the period of time that the water goes into the tub. There are two distinct functions. There's one where the water is sitting in the tub without the water coming in, but you can do it in a stepwise process and then evaluate it while the water comes in over however the water comes in at what temperature and what flow rate, and whether the flow rate is constant or whether it's just smooth. And then if you turn off the water, you have another stepwise function. So you can do it in chunks. But if you can, that, when I say steady flow, that's what I'm referring to. It's not like where you have, you know, the bathtub and you're, I don't know, you're four years old, so you're turning the water on and off in some weird random pattern, you know, or whatever. Um, but you're, you're basically having some function that you can integrate. And if we have steady flow, uh, we can look at rates. Um, as well as amounts. So the basic form of our equation for energy, which is, in the past we've said Q minus W, is equal to delta U plus delta PE plus delta KE. We can look at as a rate, which is called power, and we can say Q dot minus W dot equals delta U delta T plus delta PE delta T plus delta KE delta T. And Q dot, which is heat per time, is referred to as the rate of heat transfer. And W dot is work per time, which is referred to as power. And these are all rates of internal energy, rates of potential energy, and rates of kinetic energy. And very often, some of those terms will be eliminated from, uh, from the equation. So here, we're really looking at an instantaneous rate. And here, we're looking at sort of a finite element analysis. So we have to have that smooth function in order for this to be true. We could also write that as du dt if it were instantaneous and so forth, okay? Now, when we talk about mass, uh, we can say that the mass in the system at time one plus the mass that goes into the system minus the mass that goes out of the system, I'm talking about open system, is equal to the mass at time two and if we rewrite this just a little bit and say the mass that comes in minus the mass that goes out is equal to the mass at time two minus the mass at time one, we can recognize this as being a change in mass or a delta mass. And then we can do the same thing if it is smooth, if that function is smooth, and we can do it in terms of m dot. So we can say the mass flow rate in minus the mass flow rate out 
is equal to delta m delta t or dm cv dt, the rate of change of mass within the control volume with respect to time. Now, sort of an important thing to remember, and we've talked about this, but we need to reiterate it because we're going to start putting it into our math. We're going to start working with this mathematically. Mass is conserved, volume is not. Okay, so it's the same with mass flow rates. And an example of this would be any substance that dissolves. Um, I think I've talked about this in the past, but if you take, for example, if you, if you pick up a little packet of powdered milk, which I don't really know what it is. I mean, I know it used to be milk, but it's not really milk. Trust me on this. Um, if you pick up a packet of, of powdered milk and you take a cup of water and it says dissolve a third, you know, it says mix in a cup, a cup of water, third a cup of powdered milk, and you get a cup of milk. Do why did what happened to the third, right? You guys have all been in chemistry. Why is it not a cup and a third of product? Because the milk powder dissolved, right? So it's inside. So what do you think you're going to say about the density of the of the reconstituted milk? The density is going to be what compared to water? It's going to be higher. Exactly. There's more mass because if you took the mass of the cup of water and the mass of the powdered milk and you added those two masses together, when you put them together and if you put it on a mass balance or a scale, you would not have gained or lost any mass, okay? And this can be a fully thing for people, uh, not us, because we're too bright for this, but um, you know, it can fool people because you think that volumes are additive or volumes are conserved and they're not. Masses are conserved, volumes are not. So we can remember that since density is equal to mass per volume. And since mass is conserved, we can say mass times volume, or excuse me, density times volume is equal to mass, which is conserved. Or m dot is equal to rho times v dot, which in our other class uh, we would call q, but there's too many q's, right? We have heat, heat transfer, we could put a Q here for flow rate, volumetric flow rate, if we were in fluids, but we'll just call it V dot in this class. Um, that is also a conserved property. But the point is volume and volumetric flow rate are not conserved. So the t solution technique is to change it to a mass flow rate. And this is actually, oddly enough, we won't get into this very much, but this is actually a psychological test that they give to children to see what level of cognitive development the kid is at. And if you put um, volumes together at a certain age, kids have different responses and then they'll have a brain growth episode and they'll actually understand it. But if you put things together, um, or if you look at different shapes of containers, younger children will perceive one to be bigger than the other because they can't look, they can't understand the overall, the overarching principle until they reach a certain level of brain development. So that's kind of interesting as well. But for our purposes, uh, just remember this since I've said it. Do you any, does anyone know this? Do you know how many times you're supposed to say something before people know, know what you said? Yeah, you're smart. Five is the right answer. So, and if they're your own children, many, many more times than that. However, <laughs> 14, 26, I don't know. But five is the magic number. So when I say something over and over again, they're going to be the smarter ones of you that say, she's just said that like very many times. And then some of you, not in this class, but in other classes, might on the fifth time say, oh, she just said that one thing. So, but when I say, but I'm saying this over and over again, mass is conserved, volume is not. So there we go. All right. So we can talk about mass flow rate or mass. We can talk, we can talk about mass flow rate for steady flow or portions of flow that are steady uh, being conserved. And we can also talk about energy and power being conserved. So we can, let's just expand on this idea a little bit more. 
And those of you that are in fluids will have seen this in a slightly different form. But mass flow rate then is equal to density times volumetric flow rate. If we go back to this idea of a pipe again, and we have fluid moving into the pipe at some velocity, and we have some cross-sectional area of the pipe, this would be the area of the inlet, um, you may be able to see that if we take a slug of fluid and pass it through this area, that the volume that moved through the section is actually equal to the velocity times the area of the inlet if these two things are perpendicular to each other. So we can also say that mass flow rate is equal to density times velocity times area at a particular point and that this is conserved. So what that means, let's go back to our nozzle diffuser situation. If we have a velocity here, that would be the velocity on the inlet and a velocity on the outlet, and we have an area on the inlet, and we have an area on the outlet. If the fluid passing through this diffuser is uh, not compressible, that means the density on the inlet equals the density on the outlet. So that means that the mass flow rate in is equal to the mass flow rate out, and the mass flow rate in is equal to rho VA on the inlet equal to rho VA on the outlet. And if density is the same, that means that the velocity on the inlet times the area on the inlet is equal to the velocity on the outlet times the area on the outlet. Or the velocity on the inlet divided by the velocity of the outlet is equal to the area of the outlet divided by the area <coughs> of the inlet. So what we're really saying is that this is an inverse proportionality. That if you have a high velocity on the inlet, you're going to have a low velocity on the outlet, right? If the outlet is bigger. And for a nozzle, that relationship would be reversed. So in other words, what does this say? If density is constant, meaning it's incompressible, small area equals large velocity. And you can see this is actually just kind of like a gear ratio in the sense that it's proportional to the area. Now remember the area is a function of, if these are circular, um, R squared. So it's not a function of the radius or the diameter. It's a function of that squared. So the velocity changes a great deal with a change in the radius or diameter of the inlet or outlet. All right. So <clears throat> this idea that we're talking about, and we'll see if we can find a good problem to work this out, this is referred to as the conservation of mass principle. And the conservation of mass principle just says what we have said, that the mass at time one plus the mass that goes in minus the mass that goes out is equal to the mass at time two. Or, in a more general sense, mass is neither created nor destroyed with very few exceptions. Uh, one of those exceptions is a nuclear reaction where Einstein's equation, E is equal to mc squared, comes into place. And what Einstein's equation, this is really a very deceptively simple equation with, at this point in history, a couple only of practical applications. But C, being the speed of light, is a huge number. 
And so what it tells you is, is that if you have a wee tiny little amount of mass and you are able to move it quickly toward the speed of light, that you're going to release an incredible amount of energy. The other thing it means is that in order to move a small amount of mass toward any speed approaching the speed of light requires an incredible amount of energy. So it means both of those things, if you look at that mathematically. Um, however, this is not applicable when we're dropping things off of buildings or putting air through a diffuser. So we're not getting anywhere close to the speed of light. When you start getting to about 0.7 times the speed of light, um, so you're still significantly sublight, but very, very fast, uh, you have to take into account relativity effects. And um, there's more to it than this, but I mean, there's, there's a lot more implications. But at this point, suffice it to say that we're not going to do any nuclear reactions. The other time that it is possible that mass is not conserved, and this is really being discussed in, um, in, in physics right now, in astrophysics, but when mass falls into a black hole, um, there's a principle over time which is referred to as evaporation, and in the last few years, Stephen Hawking has actually suggested that the mass is not conserved when it goes into a black hole. It takes a long time, um, but it doesn't really make any sense with the rest of physics. So I do not, as a, phys as a non-physicist, as, as an engineer, I really don't know what that means right now. And probably if physics is given its, if, if it progresses at its current rate, it'll probably be several hundred years before anybody knows what it means. But, uh, but right now, I don't know what it means. But let's just say for us, we're just going to keep mass being equal on accounted for on either side. So, and this can be mass conservation to one other example. If you have, and this is just something that I think, um, I wish I, I should probably just bring in some candy, but if you have a, a jar and it's full of different Hershey's miniatures and you have like milk chocolate and crackle bars and Kit Kats, I don't know, and then dark chocolate. You have special darks, okay? Um, not only if you put some in and take some out, you can do mass balance on each of these things. So in other words, none, none, none of the special dark bars turn into crackle bars because you put them in a jug, right? Yeah, that's exactly correct. So everything has to be conserved uh, on that elemental uh, or unit level as well. All right, so basically the problem solution technique uh, for this chapter is going to involve determining mass and then being an accountant, accounting for it. Did it leave? Did it enter? Um, and so forth, and doing the same. And this is referred to as the conservation of mass. And if we write it as a rate equation, it can also be referred to as the continuity equation. All right. And then after we do that, after we find our masses, we then do an energy balance which is referred to as the first law of thermodynamics. All right, and that gets us up, and, and so really I guess what I'm saying is the, the authors spend a lot of time breaking things down into different appliances, like this is what a nozzle looks like, this is what a diffuser looks like, this is what a turbine looks like, this is what a heat exchanger looks like, but really it always comes down to this. Like what, if you have a turbine, what do you think it is you're trying to do with the turbine? What's the purpose of creating a turbine? Generate energy. Generate energy. It's exactly correct. So you're taking one form of energy. If you're at the base of a dam, for example, you're taking potential energy, turning it into kinetic energy, using the kinetic energy to spin, spin the blades of the turbine and produce energy. Okay. In general, turbines are more or less adiabatic, which means that heat is not really lost at a high rate from a turbine. 
what comes off of the energy what comes off is energy in the form of electrical energy so it's a conversion process there's also not a lot of opportunity for uh, a turbine to gain or lose mass the mass just passes through a turbine so if you think about what kind of an apparatus the fluid is moving through in an open system a lot of the terms of the equation will drop out just by virtue of the fact of what the system is meant to do. So I kind of prefer to look at it in that respect instead of specifically looking at 10,000 different apparatus. All right, so let's take a look and see if there's a problem where we can just talk about conservation of mass. And <clears throat> let's look at number 5-8, problem 5-8. And we are talking about a steady flow compressor. So talking about compressor, what do you think a compressor does? The name is not deceiving. The compressor compresses. That means that the pressure at the inlet is most likely less than the pressure at the outlet. That's the purpose of the compressor. All right, so we have a steady flow compressor used to compress helium. So our substance that's flowing through is helium. Starts out at 15 PSIA. And 70 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, and it compresses it to 200 and 600. 200. PSIA and 600 degrees Fahrenheit, right? The outlet area and the velocity R, the area of the outlet is uh, 0 0.01 cubic feet and the velocity on the outlet is 100 feet per second. Um, and the inlet velocity is 50 feet per second, right? It says determine the mass flow rate and the area on the inlet. Okay, now first of all, this is compressible. That means that the equation that I wrote up for an incompressible fluid uh, is not is not a valid equation because density does not remain the same. The density on the inlet is not equal to the density on the outlet and therefore uh, volumetric flow rate is not conserved. But is mass flow rate still conserved? Absolutely. Mass flow rate is conserved as long as there is not um, mass being built up or discharged from the system and in a compressor it's just a pass through. Okay. Now, the other thing I want to say is this is a very uh, inelegant representation of a compressor. The inlet is actually going to have a different size than the outlet. So this is just uh, me drawing something really, really quick. So just for say, so let's just say it's not to scale. All right. So what we have then is uh, we have a situation where the mass flow rate in is going to equal the mass flow rate out. And we know that uh, rho on the outlet times area on the outlet times velocity on the outlet is the mass flow rate out. And similarly, the mass flow rate in, or excuse me, the density on the inlet times the area on the inlet times velocity on the inlet is equal to the mass flow rate in. So I know that this is equal to this. Okay, I have the velocity on the inlet and the velocity on the outlet. Uh, I do not have the area on the inlet, but I do have the area on the outlet, and I don't have the densities on either. So that means that in order to solve these equations, the first thing is they ask me for the mass flow rate. Well, the mass flow rate in is equal to the mass flow rate out, and um, I have two of the variables on the outlet. I don't have the density. So that means this is helium and this is a gas. So I'm going to have to make some sort of a supposition about the helium 
because I don't have tables for helium to determine what my densities are at those conditions, right? So at this point in our uh, careers, what do we know? If we don't have tables, what do we use? Yes, very good. Have tables, we have to use an equation of state. And the two equations of state that we've worked with in this class are the ideal gas law and the real gas law, which involves the Z factor. We don't really have tables for, uh, I guess we, may, we might have tables for helium, <coughs> but I'm just going to say assume ideal gas law is valid. In other words, if I were going to do this and I wanted to see is there a, is there a compressibility issue with the Z factor, um, I could find, because I have temperature and pressure on both, I could find my critical pressure and temperature, I could use a generalized compressibility table, I could come out with a Z factor on the inlet and outlet. But I would prefer not to. So let's say then that pressure uh, times volume is equal to mass times R times T for helium. And uh, I know that density is mass per volume. So I can say pressure equals mass per volume times RT, or rho is equal to P over RT. Okay? So we can calculate rho on the inlet, and we can calculate rho on the outlet. And we have a P and a T value of both, uh, and all we need then is, a, is an R value for helium. So the R values for helium, I am in English units. So I'm going to go to my tables for English units. Table A1E. Helium, uh, my gas constant, I'm going to take it off in uh, PSI cubic feet per pound mass degree Rankine. Uh, the value for helium is 2.6809 in units of PSIA cubic feet per pound mass degree Rankine. Okay. So that means that my density on the inlet is going to be my pressure on the inlet, which is 15 PSIA over that R value, 2.6809 PSIA cubic feet per pound mass degree Rankine. Um, times temperature, which is 70 degrees Fahrenheit, which is what in Rankine? 70 plus 460, roughly, 459 something, is that right? So that would be 530. All right, separate that out. What happens to my units? Rankines cancel out, PSIA cancel out, and I'm left with pounds of mass per cubic foot. Is that a good unit for density? It is, isn't it? All right. So get to a calculator and punch in 15 uh, divided by 2.6809 and divide it again by that temperature of 530, and I get a density on the inlet of 0 0.01056 pounds of mass per cubic feet. Now, that's a very small number, right? But does it make sense for helium at essentially atmospheric pressure? It does, doesn't it? So um, we're at 70 degrees, which is essentially an ambient nice day temperature, and 15 PSI, which is very close to uh, atmospheric pressure. So we would expect helium, it's very light, it's lighter than air, so we would expect it to have a low density. 
Okay, on the outlet we can do the same, except we just have different values. So we have um, 200 PSI. I'm also not going to write my units because I know that my units are correct from my previous work. Divide by 2.6809 and again by 600, which is 1,060 degrees Rankin. And let's see what my density on the outlet is. Two hundred divided by two point six zero six eight zero nine, sorry. And divided again by a thousand sixty, and that value is point zero seven zero four. pounds of mass per cubic foot. Now it's still small, but it's seven times larger than the density on the inlet, isn't it? So first of all, clearly this is not incompressible. Clearly we have a factor of seven between this and this. Uh, and then it's also still very light. However, it's much heavier or much denser than it used to be, which is why we compressed it. So that's the good news. All right, so looking back at our original um, equation here. We now know that uh, the pressure on the inlet, excuse me, the density on the inlet, 0 0.01056 pounds of mass per cubic foot times the area on the inlet, which is unknown, times the velocity on the inlet, 50 feet per second, is equal to the density on the outlet, 0 0.0704 pounds of mass per cubic feet times the area on the inlet, 0 0.01 cubic feet, uh, times the velocity on the inlet, 100 feet per second, is, sorry? I do. Did I say inlet like 100 times? Yeah, I meant inlet, outlet. See, I'm still trying to say that. All right, so if I solve for the area on the inlet, which is the other piece of information they want, I guess I could have solved for the mass flow rate. Let's just, did I do that ever? No. So let's take a look. We can just use this side of the equation. If we do that, cubic feet, cubic feet, pound mass, it's going to come out in mass flow rate is going to be pound mass. This is square. So this is cubic feet, pound mass per second. So it's just going to be a value of this times this times this. Well, 0 0.01 is... 10 to the negative 2, and this is 10 to the 2. So this times this is just 1, isn't it? So what is my? Very good. See? That is my mass flow rate. All right. So I can use that value um, right here and solve for this. So I know that this is 0 .0, 0 0.0704 units of pound mass per second divided by 0 0.01056 pound of mass per cubic foot uh, times 50 feet per second. 50 or 50? It's 50. Okay, sorry. Um, and so we have pound mass, pound mass. This cancels this to second, that to that. Seconds cancel, so we have foot canceling foot to the third in the denominator of the denominator. This becomes foot squared. So my answer is going to be in feet squared, which is a good unit for um, area. So I take 0 0.0704 and divide that by 0 0.01056 and divide that again by 50. Oh, I Sorry? Well, it's in the denominator. Yeah. Yeah, so you times the denominator, but if you're talking about the yeah. quotient, you see what I'm saying? Yeah, very good. Uh, that gives me an inlet area of 0.133 square feet. 0.133 square feet. Okay. So it's quite a bit, bit bigger, isn't it? It's a factor of 0.1. 
Um, so it's 13 times the size of the outlet area. So as I said, the drawing is not to scale. All right, and that is how we use the conservation of mass to get other data. So do you guys have any questions at this point? All right, well, that'll do for today. Um, I think I'll put up a couple of homework problems and uh, just about conservation of mass and we'll talk about energy uh, beginning tomorrow. But let's take a look at, we'll do 5, 6, E. I'll put this up on Moodle, of course, as well. But 5, 6, E. And let's do, ooh, that's a good one. 5, 9. And then let's do one that we can use tables on, 514. All right, so there's your homework problems. And you guys have a great day, and we'll see you tomorrow for fluids. I'm going to stop streaming right now, so there we go.